Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast, folks. I'm Kim Skorupski, and I am looking at one of our thought leaders, Dr. Lisa Bellini. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Kim. Thanks for having me today. Well, I want to thank you so much, Lisa. You came out, you and your colleagues published a really important paper in October of 2020 in academic medicine entitled The Definition of Faculty Must Evolve, A Call to Action. And this is a really uh, seminal paper on the heels. I remember when I met Dr. Roberta Sanino a dozen years ago, thinking about what does it mean to be a faculty person? So I definitely, I loved your paper. We've been thinking a lot about the paper at Hopkins here and thought we need to have you on the podcast. So Faculty Factory listeners and friends, remember, we are a faculty affairs and faculty development community sharing tools to build leaders. That's why we're the Faculty Factory. And Dr. Lisa Bellini is the Senior Vice Dean for Academic Affairs and a professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And again, she is one of the thought leaders in this space. And we were talking before about sharing how this topic, who are faculty, what is a faculty member and why it's so important now, especially on the heels of the pandemic. And then leave us with some kind of inspiration and some enthusiasm about a reminder of why we are in this space and what why we do what we do and give us some hope for the future. So Lisa, why don't you start us off on uh, you know, talking about this, this, this notion. Yeah, so being a faculty member is a very special title. It involves um, a commitment to academic work that not every physician or scientist shares. And when you're a faculty member, it, it really implies, it's actually derived from a Latin term that focuses on communities of teachers and scholars. And so when we started thinking about this work, it's it was more about how do we preserve the fundamental functions of being a faculty member and highlight for all the current stakeholders involved in medicine that being a faculty member is still critically important and it's a differentiating feature of being either a physician or a scientist and so that that ability and desire to teach and to innovate and discover and disseminate knowledge and practice is a privilege that we all get to share as faculty members. And so thinking about how to highlight that and revalue it and restate it in a way that continues to highlight the relevance of that role at the time we embarked on this work we felt was very important. Thank you for reminding us of that, the privilege to be in this space and also reminding us why we came here in this noble profession. And that, and I, I always think of that, how, what a noble calling it is. And yet sometimes that when I think of this as a privilege, it almost makes me feel like, well, then because it's so, we're so noble, we're so privileged, we should be willing to just sacrifice everything and endure all these hardships and just um, struggle through the challenges because we are doing this because we're so selfless. And and so I, I'm, I'm sensitive to the fact that this is a calling for many of us. And yet there is an obligation of our institutions to to recognize and support this mission. I think you you hit the nail on the head there. Institutions, whoever you might work for, whether it's an academic clinic, a medical school, they have to support you with time, with the time and resources necessary to be effective in your academic roles. From a teaching perspective, you know, gone are the days where you can just have somebody join you in clinic and just observe. The expectation now is that you are providing clinical supervision, that you're teaching that individual trainee as you go through an afternoon or an OR case or an inpatient um, consultation, and you're giving them feedback on their clinical reasoning and their clinical skills, all under the guise of managing a patient. Doing that effectively takes time. And faculty time 
needs to be protected to be able to do that and do it effectively. And if we aren't protecting and supporting faculty time, then education gets marginalized to the least amount of time it takes to provide care for the patient. And the people who end up suffering in the end of that are the people we're trying to teach as well as ourselves, because it creates a real moral dissonance when you can't do the kind of job that you really wanted to do in terms of teaching and mentoring and inspiring the next generation of learners, because there's so much pressure coming from other dimensions for you to do the other work that you need to do. And so there's a balance here that has to be recognized that I think has slowly over time been eroded such that many individuals now who consider themselves faculty members get very little support for teaching um, and potentially even their scholarly activities. That's right. That's right. You know, everything you're saying is exactly right. And we were talking before that post-pandemic, it's even more of a challenge. We we're talking about new learners coming out and they didn't maybe have the chance and they're in year two or year three, they didn't have the chance to do um, complete training like some of uh, some of us did learn. And so they're coming to us perhaps with different skill sets, different expectations, not having had that personal interaction, um, not yes. being kind of oriented into the the norms and the way we we do business so it's it's i think even more exacerbated in this quarantining era where we've got a whole bunch of new learners coming down the pike with a whole different set of expectations and experiences and and ways of being so i think there's even that additional layer of the funds flows and the models that um put value on what we're doing and squeeze us and losing margin that it's even add on to this, the cultural aspect of a pandemic is really putting us in a a sticky spot. So how are, how are you handling that at, at Penn, Lisa? I would add two points to what you just made. One is that during the period of the pandemic was such an intense period of education innovation in such a short period of time I, for someone who's been in med ed for many, many years, I the compression of innovation during the three years of the pandemic, two plus years, was truly extraordinary. Mm. The, the advancement that occurred in the incorporation of technology, new innovative ways to teach using online resources. And what's interesting to me about that compression of innovation is faculty development has not yet caught up Mm. with all of the innovation that's been implemented in med ed. And, And I bring that up because faculty development takes time. And faculty members who are under pressure from the clinical environment or the research environment don't necessarily have the time carved out for faculty development activities. And oftentimes they need to do it on their own if they even have access to it at all. And so the the ability to stay current and relevant in the pedagogies that are active and being taught in your institution, new ways of teaching, new ways of promoting learners, particularly learners with different skill sets, as you you noted, I think is, is becoming increasingly challenging. So Being able to get faculty members together to talk about best practices related to teaching and to teach them in a very focused way, in a focused and deliberate way, how best to execute their teaching roles is really important. And I I think faculty development has fallen a little bit behind there. The, The other thing I would mention or call out, academic medicine in general not just even academic medicine, but medicine in general is is now under tremendous pressure clinically post-pandemic. Places there have been more mergers, mm-hmm. more acquisitions, rural hospitals going out of business, um, right. even hospitals in our, you know, in our Philadelphia marketplace have have gone under because of the weight of the pandemic. So that redistributes patients, it redistributes learners to Mm -hmm. the other 
systems in the area, which creates even additional stresses. Um, and obviously how we're paying for care and how institutions are being reimbursed for care mm -hmm. is also under tremendous stress. And so the, the days of being able to cross subsidize the educational mission and the research missions based on clinical revenues have, have really shrunk. And yeah. it's much, much harder to do that. And so part of the reason that this group got together to evolve the definition of faculty was to really start to think about how can you begin to quantitate the contributions faculty members are making from a teaching perspective. And some places have moved this to from the RVU concept, as it were, to an EVU concept, educational value units, and try to develop some parity, at least as it relates to time that you would spend in either clinical or educational activities. And I, those places that have started to do that at least have the ability to quantify the importance of teaching and the value of teaching organizationally right. for promotion, for teaching awards, for how much effort may or may not be supported um, in an educational role or with educational responsibilities. And so the, the, the need to quantify it becomes really important when there's such pressure in the environment for people to define their roles and their activities. And that's a lot of what this work has attempted to do. Right. And, and in the past, what, seven, maybe seven plus years now at Penn, because in that article, the definition of faculty must evolve, a call to action in the October 2020 academic medicine, you, you show us, you point us to your model at Penn and how it's been defined and operationalized there. Can you give us any um, insight into how that has, has gone over with faculty and with administration and how that's been playing out? Yeah, so um, we have faculty who we have over 3,000 faculty members now. Um, it's actually grown quite a bit. They record their teaching activities in the teaching activity workbook that's referenced in the article. There have been some changes to it. Uh, since this was published, but the general set concept remains the same. So people can quantify their teaching effort, and we have minimum thresholds for promotion related to teaching. But we've also tried to build in um, what is your impact been as mm. a teacher? And so your trajectory as a teacher or an educator, your impact as a teacher or an educator, and how that evolves over time. And this has led us more in the direction of a holistic review process for promotion. And education is a very important component of what we do. And so there are lots of different ways, as are mentioned uh, in this article, it's more than just lecturing or clinical activities, right. but it's the people who are deeply involved in assessment, for example, on clinical competency committees or creating standardized patient programs or simulations um, that take a tremendous amount of time. But those sorts of activities are really important the mentoring that many of us find so mm. valuable and personally right. satisfying takes a significant amount of time. We, we need to value those activities if we want people to continue to engage in them. Same thing with um, people who in the basic sciences who spend a lot of time hosting students in their laboratories for lab rotations or you know, sitting on thesis committees of individuals. And then obviously there's this whole world of educational leadership, um, particularly now with the associate program directors and core faculty and all of the course directors that are necessary in the medical school. Um, those components are really important to having a robust educational environment. You can't do it without those roles and without those responsibilities. And so valuing that becomes really important. So it's not just about the evaluation that you get from the lecture you might have given, but it's all these different activities that can be pulled together in a teaching portfolio 
that then can be presented um, in a way that demonstrates your trajectory and your impact as an educator. Yeah. Oh, Lisa, thank you so much for sharing this with the public and, and getting this word out. I like this concept of the holistic review. And you're making me you're making me think and appreciate how how this process evolved because it's so much work to think about all the elements and all the factors that go into being an educator, an educational scholar. And I'm I'm wondering or I'm betting that there are some faculty and leaders who were surprised um, at the amount of work. It, it's, you're making me think of like the annual review process or any time we do something and to put it in like mm-hmm. in, in lay terms, when you go to the gym or someone's as, asking you, do you want to like rehaul your, your dietary pattern or your exercise routine? And we tend to overestimate certain things or us to, and underestimate how long we worked out or exercise or how many glasses of water we drank, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm imagining that there are faculty and leaders out there who just kind of like you know, spitball the numbers. But then when you actually sit down and, as you said, that put value to and quantify this all the time, those those incidental little mentoring moments and all that, that is quite a quite an effort. And I'll bet you that there were people who were like, oh, my gosh, I had no idea that this is the amount of time. I spend on this. And yes, that time has money. Exactly. That, that money is not only exactly it's, it's opportunity cost and loss for things. When we started this project, um, there wasn't uh, there wasn't an intent to connect the amount of teaching effort reported with compensation. And in large part, that was because I knew and other individuals who were involved in this with me knew that it, we grossly underestimated the amount of effort that faculty mm-hmm. were spending on these right. activities because you're right. You just sort of do things and you don't even remember that you met with a student two weeks ago or wh- whatever the case may be. So it, it really wasn't until we started quantifying things that we realized all of the effort that was being put into teaching And so we have been able to work with um, the concept of educational funds flow in our institution, where the amount of effort by a given department um, can be recognized in that funds flow formula. So, So very similar to clinical funds flow, for example, or research subsidies, research funds flow that's coming through for investigators, Mm -hmm. education funds flow can be, it's not going to be a one-to-one, it's never going to be one-to-one, but you could recognize magnitudes of effort within a given department or a division with an educational funds flow formula. And, And in fact, institutions that are using EVUs, that's essentially what they're doing. Um, And so there are different ways to do this, but it always goes back to how are you going to quantitate how much teaching, how much education is actually going on? And at Penn, before we got into this, every department did it differently. So we have 38 departments. Um, Mm -hmm. Every single department had a different formula and weighted things differently. So at the level of the school, it was really difficult to compare departments and you couldn't really establish a funds flow mechanism with that level of variability. Right. So this has helped that. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. I, I love this work. I lo- again, thought leader here, everybody, you're listening to Dr. Lisa, B- Lisa Bellini at Penn. Uh, Lisa, I, I would love to just kind of go back to something that's near and dear to my heart that you said Earlier, we're talking about two kind of important drivers, and one was the compression of innovation. And then you talked about medicine being under pressure writ large. But as a faculty development person who's been doing this for 17 years, and I live and breathe it, everything I I watch and hear and learn, I'm talking to movies and conversations at the grocery store, I always think of our faculty. And you know, you are so right when you said that we faculty development has not kept pace with the rapid changes and all that that compression of innovation and technology and the way we all pivoted and recalibrated. The closest, you know, of course, we're, we're all thinking 
back in the day, we'd have faculty would sign up for a two, three hour workshop or a two or three hour seminar. And that was not uncommon. It would take advanced exactly. notice, but they would do that. Then we right. all know nationally during COVID, we all went to Zoom and every we were all so excited that a lot of faculty were voting by mouse click and they were coming into our sessions on via Zoom and our enrollments went up. And then now it's kind of post-COVID, our enrollments have precipitously dropped. And it's because our faculty, well, I hypothesize, and it's been Mm -hmm. endorsed um, anecdotally they're doing everything on youtube they're listening they're listening and multitasking so given the way our faculty colleague instructors and learners are consuming this new educational content in this new format this new way how do we meet those needs of both learners who demand something to be delivered when they want it when they need it how they need it and the instructors who are having to learn and pick up all these new strategies of delivering that content? How do we marry those competing demands? Yeah, that is a great question and certainly one we are grappling with um, here at Penn because the vast majority of our faculty don't have the tools to be able to create the educational products that the trainees want to consume. And so where we find ourselves right now is how do we provide that support? Do we provide a recording studio for faculty to come in and make their recordings? Do we provide um, editors so that their you know, podcast or video file can be edited in a more professional way? These are all things that we're actually starting to think about as tools to support faculty. And I, I think you know, this this goes back to something you mentioned earlier on, which is we're just evolving as educators over time. And we've moved completely from the lecture-based format with a professor, a chalkboard, and 300 people to much more individualized adult-style learning that is much shorter and much more focused than it used to be. And that's not necessarily a bad thing but we haven't necessarily kept up with helping faculty be able to evolve with the evolving pedagogy that's expected by students, trainees, and even you know medical school academic personnel in student affairs offices, et cetera. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, this this is the the challenge we have here at Hopkins as well is trying to figure out the value of faculty development and professional career development from the wearing my faculty development hat, the value of this content to our faculty members as they are struggling with all these competing demands on their end, as they're trying to be, they're teaching and they're trying to interface and help their patients in all these new ways. It's, it's, it's a constant struggle because what I do feel is a, is a real, a, a visceral absence of community. And that's the one thing that I'm yeah. really, that kind of hurts my heart. I definitely appreciate the efficiency of the Zoom format. And and I agree with you that we're not going to get away with this. There's no way we're going to go back to the olden days, the good old days. So if that's the given, you know, the new reality, how do we, um, you know, where do we find community? Where do we build community? Where do we have that those relationships if everything is in a short snippet, condensed, jump in, jump out, you know, world? Uh, are we are going are we going to miss this? And how do we how do we embed that? Have you you know what do you think about that, Lisa? Oh, I think that's one of the most vexing questions post COVID. Quite honestly, it's. What is community now? And it, it's not just at the level of the faculty, but at level of staff, residents, students, et cetera. And, and how do you establish it if you're if you still spend a good chunk of your day like I do on Zoom? So we're, you know, all of my meetings are not one-on-one face-to-face anymore. There's still at least half on Zoom. And there is a difference in the connection you make with people on virtually versus in person. I think part of the challenge for educators is there there is the need to transmit knowledge 
which you could do asynchronously by either providing material that can be reviewed independently of you. You generated it. You're the author. You're the expert. Students, trainees, your colleagues could review that independently or asynchronously. And then trying to bring people together, either in you know, small break rooms virtually or in person, for the key elements that actually promote the engagement. So not a lecture, but what is the actual learning activity that's going to occur? And we often group these under facilitated learning activities, small group discussions, role plays, you know, things that are really going to be engaging to the audience. I think trying to focus on those pieces in shorter increments. So does it need to be an hour? Probably not. And most people would find it really hard to carve out an hour at this point. But maybe it's 30 minute touch points at different in different periods of time to get people together to role play about feedback after they've done the pre-work or creating trigger videos that allow them to work through the case themselves. And essentially that, that serves as um, the rubric or the theme for an in-person or virtual breakout room session. I think we need to get more creative to attract people, particularly faculty learners, and really make it worth their while. But but doing that for people like you and me is going to require that we shift our approach a bit to faculty development and maybe resource different types of tools that we haven't resourced in the past. Oh, Lisa, a genius. I love how you said trigger videos. I have never heard that phrase, those words used together, because a lot of times, you know, we show videos. I'm thinking of oh, one of my favorites tried and true in the resilience content I teach, the Heather Dornadin Penn State Racer. It's in the, in tra the track. It's a race. I think it's a 500 meter. I'm not a runner, didn't run track, but basically spoiler alert, she is supposed to win. And at lap number three or four, she falls down and everybody passes her. I mean, they're gone and she goes, she ends up winning. She wins the race. So not all, she turns on the after, after, after burners and flies through it. But so yes, videos, but trick, what this trigger video, you're really getting me excited here because that's where, you know, I think educators listening to, uh, listening to you right now go, well, yeah, sure. We, you know, pre-work, but then sometimes they don't do the pre-work and then people, because they're trying to be efficient with their time. I'm thinking, of course, faculty members or even any learner. They might zip through it or say, why should I bother going to the session, the live or the Zoom session, if everything's, if I'm going to get the slides or the materials. Right. But if, but if you, if we purposely, purposely, purposely create creative opportunities to engage, that's where I think the sparks of community where yes. the, aha, you can't get this, this cannot be got from the pre-work, this kind of. Yes. nuance and subtlety and interaction and ideas and that those creative experiences are th something that will always be um always be i think the bread and butter of educators right to, to create yeah. opportunities and experiences and and we all do our best well i should say our most innovative work when we're together because people have different perspectives we're not all I mean, we share the common goal of and value of being an educator, but we don't all do it the same way. And we come from a different set of professional and personal experiences that inform essentially what is being created. And so having people in a room when you get to the point of, you know, OK, the video you just mentioned, OK, like how how can we use this particular video to talk about grit or resilience mm -hmm. and and now let's have a discussion which yeah. is very different than kind of watch this on your own and write an essay or i'm going to give you the definitions of grit and resilience and here's some things that you should try the next time you're on service or you know in a clinic or whatever I think we have to get much more creative along the lines of what you're talking about. And I think if we do, if we can, and we're resourced 
to do it. And, and again, for people who are in charge of these faculty development type programs, it, it is going to require a bit of a frame shift in terms of how we think about things and what we resource within our own environments, recognizing that, you know, we're all working with a fixed pool of resources, but we can realign them in, in different ways to help support what I, I think is completely evolving in a very different direction. And, and people will vote with their feet. I think if we can get that piece back, and particularly the community component of it is just so critical. I, maybe it works. Um, I hope it does. I, I can't see how, how it does it. And, and you said something earlier that I think is really important, too, is that recalibrating the value of this will require faculty instructors, our colleagues, to think very carefully about all the work that will that this will entail to be creative, to to reach out to our colleagues in other schools, um, yes, in yes. other technology spaces, in other industries to really ramp up and amp up our portfolios of education. Because it, it, it's not enough to just come up with a scenario. Here you go. It's in the chat. Open it up, read it and talk about it. Because now I'm thinking, you, Lisa, you made me think of a, a hidden brain episode, a recent one. So I think by the time this it was an April, an April hidden pod, hidden brain podcast where, oh God, gosh, and I can't remember who he's talking. I think it may have been a, a professor at Penn, as a matter of fact. But no, he he went to a classroom and the the teacher was trying to give a lesson on the Underground Railroad, and so she had the students break out, um, actually cook, make bake cookies or make bread, make bread, and it was a three hour thing where the educator was noticing that. The, the students were learning more about the bread making versus the Underground Railroad. So to connect while the teacher, he's like, well, why did you make them bake bread? She's like, well, I was trying to get them to understand, you know, what was required when you're going to go through this passage. You had to have food. So they had to make the food. And it was a great intention. But the point is that the the as a the instructor was thinking and explaining to us, the activity itself was if you'd ask the learners later, they were all about how to bake the bread, but didn't quite make the connection to mm-hmm. Underground Railroad, rather saying, maybe, okay, you're, we're going to go on this trip and we're not going to have access to these things. What do you do? What do you pack? You know, you're going on Desert Island. What do you pack? Kind of a scenario. So you're making me think, Lisa, about this idea of being creative, that being really um, intentional on the activities and the exercises that will build community and and leverage the infusion of diversity in the room. I mean, you talk about diversity, equity, inclusion. When we get all those different brains and minds and hearts in the room, that's where the genius happens. So that's going to take work. And faculty have to be rewarded and compensated. They have to document that. And institutions have to um, recognize that. Yes? Absolutely. And, And I think if you're using a framework like what we've published, then you know, probably within the next six to 12 months, you're refreshing it and you're taking a look at how do we define these activities? Do they do they need a review um, to broaden the definition to fit the current time? And how do we recalibrate the value? Should, should the value be recalibrated at all? And maybe in some instances, no, but maybe in other instances, yes. And that's, I think, the beauty of having a framework, particularly at the level at the organizational level or the school level, because you can adapt and adopt um, as you know medicine evolves, and certainly as medical education evolves. Right, right, and absolutely, the definition of faculty must evolve. A call to action: you have to absolutely, you must read this article and look at that wonderful framework at Penn. Uh, it makes so much sense, and. I, it's a really good model for us to um, to adopt to go forward. And you're right; if we don't evolve, we don't adapt. We are going to be um, irrelevant. So I think it's really important for us to, as educators and as learners, we have to work together to get to the next step while while appreciating some fundamentals of learning and how we learn. And I think you said it well, Lisa, that we learn best when we are together. And so. Yes, there, there's value in being self-taught and doing things on our own. And yet we the magnitude of order is just 
unbelievable when you sit in a room and you hear someone else's take on something and you shift your lens and your frame of how you look at things. So we we just need to make it worth people's time. Right. And right. and that I think we, we haven't figured that out yet. I think everybody who does faculty development and promotes faculty development is working on that right now. Um and it's not easy. This is not easy work, but it's critically important because this is the imprint we are giving the next generation of learners who will be us someday. Well said. Well said. Dr. Lisa Bellini, thank you so much for being on the Faculty Factory podcast today. You can check Dr. Bellini out at Penn, all the wonderful things University of Pennsylvania is doing there. And again, thank you so much for sharing your time with us on the Faculty Factory podcast, Lisa. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.